The Girl and the Photograph by Lucy Maud Montgomery When I heard that Peter Austin was in Vancouver, I hunted him up. I had met Peter ten years before, when I had gone east to visit my father's people, and had spent a few weeks with an uncle in Croydon. The Austins lived across the street from Uncle Tom, and Peter and I had struck up a friendship, although he was a hobbledehoy of awkward sixteen, and I, at twenty-two, was older, and wiser, and more dignified than I have ever been since, or ever expected to be again. Peter was a jolly little round freckled chap. He was all right when no girls were around. When they were, he retired within himself, like a misanthropic oyster, and was about as interesting. This was the one point upon which we always disagreed. Peter couldn't endure girls. I was devoted to them by the wholesale. The Croydon girls were pretty and vivacious. I had a score of flirtations during my brief sojourn among them. But when I went away, the face I carried in my memory was not that of any girl with whom I had walked and driven and played the game of hearts. It was ten years ago, but I had never been quite able to forget that girl's face. Yet I had seen it but once, and then only for a moment. I had gone for a solitary ramble in the woods over the river, and in a lonely little valley dim with pines, where I thought myself alone. I had come suddenly upon her, standing ankle-deep in fern on the bank of a brook, the late evening sunshine falling yellowly on her uncovered dark hair. She was very young, no more than sixteen, yet the face and eyes were already those of a woman. Such a face! Beautiful! Yes, but I thought of that afterward, when I was alone. With that face before my eyes, I thought only of its purity and sweetness, of the lovely soul and rich mind looking out, of the great greyish-blue eyes which, in the dimness of the pine shadows, looked almost black. There was something in the face of that child woman I had never seen before, and was destined never to see again in any other face. Careless boy though I was, it stirred me to the deeps. I felt that she must have been waiting forever in that pine valley, for me, and that in finding her, I had found all of good that life could offer me. I would have spoken to her, but before I could shape my greeting into words that should not seem rude or presumptuous, she had turned and gone, stepping lightly across the brook and vanishing in the maple copse beyond. For no more than ten seconds had I gazed into her face, and the soul of her, the real woman behind the fair outwardness, had looked back into my eyes, but I had never been able to forget it. When I returned home, I questioned my cousins diplomatically as to who she might be. I felt strangely reluctant to do so. It seemed in some way sacrilege, yet only by so doing could I hope to discover her. They could tell me nothing, nor did I meet her again during the remainder of my stay in Croydon, although I never went anywhere without looking for her, and haunted the Pine Valley daily in the hope of seeing her again. My disappointment was so bitter that I laughed at myself. I thought I was a fool to feel thus about a girl I had met for a moment in a chance ramble. A mere child at that, with her hair still hanging in its long, glossy schoolgirl braid. But when I remembered her eyes, my wisdom forgave me. Well, that was ten years ago. In those ten years the memory had, I must confess, grown dimmer. In our busy Western life a man had not much time for sentimental recollections. Yet I had never been able to care for another woman. I wanted to. I wanted to marry and settle down. I had come to the time of life when a man wearies of drifting and begins to hanker for a calm anchorage in some snug haven of his own. But somehow I shirked the matter. It seemed rather easier to let things slide. At this stage, Peter came west. He was something in a bank and was as round and jolly as ever. But he had evidently changed his attitude towards girls, for his rooms were full of their photos. They were stuck around everywhere, and they were all pretty. Either Peter had excellent taste, or the Croydon photographers knew how to flatter. But there was one on the mantel which attracted my attention especially. If the photo were to be trusted, 
The girl was quite the prettiest I had ever seen. Peter, what pretty girl's picture is this on your mantle? I called out to Peter, who was in his bedroom, donning evening dress for some function. That's my cousin, Marianne Lindsay, he answered. She is rather nice looking, isn't she? Lives in Croydon now. Used to live up the river at Chislehurst. Didn't you have a chance across her when you were in Croydon? No, I said. If I had, I wouldn't have forgotten her face. Well, she'd only be a kid then, of course. She's twenty-six now. Marianne is a mighty nice girl. But she's bound to be an old maid. She's got notions, ideals, she calls them. All the Croydon fellows have been in love with her at one time or another, but they might as well have made up to a statue. Marianne really hasn't a spark of feeling or sentiment in her. Her looks are the best part of her although she's confoundedly clever. Peter spoke rather squiffily. I suspected that he had been one of the smitten swains himself. I looked at the photo for a few minutes longer, admiring it more every minute, and when I heard Peter coming out, I did an unjustifiable thing. I took that photo and put it in my pocket. I expected Peter would make a fuss when he missed it, but that very night the house in which he lived was burned to the ground. Peter escaped with the most important of his goods and chattels, but all the counterfeit presentments of his dear divinities went up in smoke. If he ever thought particularly of Marianne Lindsay's photograph, he must have supposed that it shared the fate of the others. As for me, I propped my ill-gotten treasure up on my mantle and worshipped it for a fortnight. At the end of that time, I went boldly to Peter and told him I wanted him to introduce me by letter to his dear cousin, and ask her to agree to a friendly correspondence with me. Oddly enough, I did not do this without some reluctance, in spite of the fact that I was as much in love with Marianne Lindsay as it was possible to be through the medium of a picture. I thought of the girl I had seen in the pine wood, and felt an inward shrinking from a step that might divide me from her forever, but I rated myself for this nonsense. It was in the highest degree unlikely that I should ever meet the girl of the pines again. If she were still living, she was probably some other man's wife. I would think no more about it. Peter whistled when he heard what I had to say. Of course I'll do it, old man, he said obligingly. But I warn you, I don't think it will be much use. Marianne isn't the sort of girl to open up a correspondence in such a fashion. However, I'll do the best I can for you. Do. Tell her I'm a respectable fellow with no violent bad habits and all that. I'm in earnest, Peter. I want to make that girl's acquaintance, and this seems the only way at present. I can't get off just now for a trip east. Explain all this and use your cousinly influence in my behalf if you possess any. Peter grinned. It's not the most graceful job in the world you are putting on me, Curtis, he said. I don't mind owning up to that now but I was pretty far gone on Marianne myself two years ago. It's all over now, but it was bad while it lasted. Perhaps Marianne will consider your request more favourably if I put it in the light of a favour to myself. She must feel that she owes me something for wrecking my life. Peter grinned again and looked at the one photo he had contrived to rescue from the fire. It was a pretty snub-nosed little girl. She would never have consoled me for the loss of Marianne Lindsay, but every man to his taste. In due time, Peter sought me out to give me his cousin's answer. Congratulations, Curtis. You've out Caesar Caesar. You've conquered without even going and seeing. Marianne agrees to a friendly correspondence with you. I am amazed, I admit, even though I did paint you up as a sort of Sir Galahad and Lancelot combined. I'm not used to seeing proud Marianne do stunts like that and it rather takes my breath. I wrote to Marianne Lindsay, after one farewell dream of the girl under the pines. When Marianne's letter began to come regularly, I forgot the other one altogether. Such letters, such witty, sparkling, clever, womanly, delightful letters, they completed the conquest her picture had begun. Before we had corresponded six months, I was besottedly in love with this woman, whom I had never even seen. Finally, I wrote and told her so, and I asked her to be my wife. A fortnight later, her answer came. 
She said frankly that she believed she had learned to care for me during our correspondence, but that she thought we should meet in person before coming to any definite understanding. Could I not arrange to visit Croydon in the summer? Until then we would better continue on our present footing. I agreed to this, but I consider myself practically engaged, with the personal meeting merely to be regarded as a sop to the Cerberus of conventionality. I permitted myself to use a decidedly lover-like tone in my letters henceforth, and I hailed it as a favourable omen that I was not rebuked for this, although Marianne's own letters still retained their pleasant, simple friendliness. Peter had at first tormented me mercilessly about the affair, but when he saw I did not like his chafe, he stopped it. Peter was always a good fellow. He realised that I regarded the matter seriously, and he saw me off when I left for the East with a grin, tempered by honest sympathy and understanding. Good luck to you, he said. If you win Marianne Lindsay, you'll win a pearl among women. I haven't been able to grasp her taking to you in this fashion, though. It's so unlike Marianne. But since she undoubtedly has, you are a lucky man. I arrived in Croydon at dusk and went to Uncle Tom's. There I found them busy with preparations for a party to be given that night, in honour of a girl friend, who was visiting my cousin Edna. I was secretly annoyed, for I wanted to hasten at once to Marianne, but I wouldn't decently get away, and on second thoughts I was consoled by the reflection that she would probably come to the party. I knew she belonged to the same social set as Uncle Tom's girls. I should, however, have preferred our meeting to have been under different circumstances. From my stand behind the palms in a corner, I eagerly scanned the guests as they arrived. Suddenly my heart gave a bound. Marianne Lindsay had just come in. I recognised her at once from her photograph. It had not flattered her in the least. Indeed, it had not done her justice, for her exquisite colouring of hair and complexion were quite lost in it. She was, moreover, gowned, with a taste and smartness eminently admirable in the future Mrs. Eric Curtis. I felt a thrill of proprietary pride as I stepped out from behind the palms. She was talking to Aunt Grace, but her eyes fell on me. I expected a little start of recognition, for I had sent her an excellent photograph of myself, but her gaze was one of blankest unconsciousness. I felt something like disappointment at her non-recognition, but I consoled myself by the reflection that people often fail to recognise other people whom they have seen only in photographs, no matter how good the likeness may be. I waylaid Edna, who was passing at that time, and said, Edna, I want you to introduce me to the girl who is talking to your mother. Edna laughed. So you have succumbed at first sight to our Croydon beauty. Of course I'll introduce you, but I warn you beforehand that she is the most incorrigible flirt in Croydon or out of it. So take care. It jarred on me to hear Marianne called a flirt. It seemed so out of keeping with her letters and the womanly delicacy and fineness revealed in them. But I reflected that women sometimes find it hard to forgive another woman who absorbs more than her fair share of lovers and generally take their revenge by dubbing her a flirt, whether she deserves the name or not. We had crossed the room during this reflection. Marianne turned and stood before us, smiling at Edna, but evincing no recognition whatever of myself. It is a piquant experience to find yourself awaiting an introduction to a girl to whom you are virtually engaged. Dorothy, dear, said Edna, this is my cousin, Mr. Curtis from Vancouver. Eric, this is Miss Armstrong. I suppose I bowed. Habit carries us mechanically through many impossible situations. I don't know what I looked like or what I said, if I said anything. I don't suppose I betrayed my dire confusion, for Edna went off unconcernedly without another glance at me. Dorothy Armstrong? Gracious powers! Who? Where? Why? If this girl was Dorothy Armstrong, who was Marianne Lindsay? To whom was I engaged? There was some awful mistake somewhere, for it could not be possible that there were two girls in Croydon who looked exactly like the photograph, reposing my valise at that very moment. 
I stammered like a schoolboy. I, oh, I, your face seems familiar to me, Miss Armstrong. I, I think I must have seen your photograph somewhere. Probably in Peter Austin's collection, smiled Miss Armstrong. He had one of mine before he was burned out. How is he? Peter? Oh, he's well, I replied vaguely. I was thinking a hundred words to the second, but my thoughts arrived nowhere. I was staring at Miss Armstrong like a man bewitched. She must have thought me a veritable booby. Oh, by the way, can you tell me, do you know a Miss Lindsay in Croydon? Miss Armstrong looked surprised and a little bored. Evidently, she was not used to having newly introduced young men inquiring about another girl. Marianne, Lindsay? Oh, yes. Is she here tonight? I said. No, Marianne is not going to parties just now, owing to the recent death of her aunt, who lived with them. Does she, oh, uh, does she look like you at all? I inquired idiotically. Amusement glimmered, but over Miss Armstrong's boredom. She probably concluded that I was some harmless lunatic. Like me, not at all. There couldn't be two people more dissimilar. Marianne is quite dark. I am fair, and our features are altogether unlike. Why, good evening, Jack. Yes, I believe I did promise you this dance. She bowed to me and skimmed away with Jack. I saw Aunt Grace bearing down upon me and fled incontinently. In my own room I flung myself on a chair and tried to think the matter out. Where did the mistake come from? How had it happened? I shut my eyes and conjured up the vision of Peter's room that day. I remembered vaguely that when I had picked up Dorothy Armstrong's picture, I had noticed another photograph that had fallen face downward beside it. That must have been Marianne Lindsay's, and Peter had thought I meant it. And now what a position I was in. I was conscious of bitter disappointment. I had fallen in love with Dorothy Armstrong's photograph. As far as external semblance goes, it was she whom I loved. I was practically engaged to another woman, a woman who, in spite of our correspondence, seemed to me now, in the shock of this discovery, a stranger. It was useless to tell myself that it was the mind and soul revealed in those letters that I loved, and that the mind and soul were Marianne Lindsay's. It was useless to remember that Peter had said she was pretty. Exteriorly, she was a stranger to me. Hers was not the face which had risen before me, for nearly a year, as the face of the woman I loved. Was ever unlucky wretch in such a predicament before? Well, there was only one thing to do. I must stand by my word. Marianne Lindsay was the woman I had asked to marry me, whose answer I must shortly go to receive. If that answer were yes, I must accept the situation and banish all thought of Dorothy Armstrong's pretty face. Next evening at sunset, I went to Glenwood, the Lindsay place. Doubtless an eager lover might have gone earlier, but an eager lover I certainly was not. Probably Marianne was expecting me, and had given orders concerning me, for the maid who came to the door conveyed me to a little room behind the stairs, a room which, as I felt as soon as I entered it, was a woman's pet domain. In its books and pictures and flowers, it spoke eloquently of dainty femininity. Somehow it suited the letters. It did not feel quite so much the stranger as I had felt. Nevertheless, when I heard a light footfall on the stairs, my heart beat painfully. I stood up and turned to the door, but I could not look up. The footsteps came nearer. I knew that a white hand swept aside the portiere at the entrance. I knew that she had entered the room and was standing before me. With an effort, I raised my eyes and looked at her. She stood tall and gracious, in a ruby splendour of sunset falling through the window beside her. The light quivered like living radiance over a dark, proud head, a white throat and a face before whose perfect loveliness the memory of Dorothy Armstrong's laughing prettiness faded like a star in the sunrise, never more in the fullness of the day to be remembered. Yet it was not of her beauty, I thought, as I stood spellbound before her. I seemed to see a dim little valley full of whispering pines, and a girl standing under their shadows, looking at me with the same great greyish-blue eyes, 
which gazed upon me now from Marianne Lindsay's face, the same face matured into gracious womanhood that I had seen ten years ago, and loved, I loved ever since. I took an unsteady step forward. Marianne, I said. When I got home that night, I burned Dorothy Armstrong's photograph. The next day I went to my cousin Tom, who owns the fashionable studio of Croydon, and binding him over to secrecy, sought one of Marianne's latest photographs from him. It is the only secret I have ever kept from my wife. Before we were married, Marianne told me something. I always remembered you as you looked that day under the pines, she said. I was only a child, but I think I loved you then and ever afterwards. When I dreamed my girl's dream of love, your face rose up before me. I had the advantage of you that I knew your name. I had heard of you. When Peter wrote about you, I knew who you were. That was why I agreed to correspond with you. I was afraid it was a forward, an unwomanly thing to do, but it seemed my chance for happiness, and I took it. I am glad I did. I did not answer in words, but lovers will know how I did answer. 